Worship. Call of worship is from Psalm 36, verses 7 through 9. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Joseph Parker, what you first time?
2 Kings chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4, and we'll pick up our reading at verse 8, that's page 392 in your line, 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. One day Elisha went down, excuse me, went on to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, Behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. One day he came there, and he turned into the chamber and rested there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call this Shunammite. When he had called her, she stood before him. And he said to, he said to him, Say now to her, See, you have taken all this trouble from us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? She answered, I dwell among my own people. And he said, What then is to be done for her? Gehazi answered, Well, she has no son, and her husband is old. He said, Call her. When he had called her, she stood in the doorway, and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace the son. And she said, No, my lord, O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son about that time the following spring, as Elisha had said to her. Psalms 139, read verses 17 and 18. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. The final reading is in the New Testament, the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verses 21 through 29. You who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. We thank you, O oh Father, for your compassion on your people. And we thank you for the way in which you looked after this woman of long ago, who out of her kindness and love took care of your prophet and gave him rest along his way. We thank you that in your mercies and love, you show her mercy.
mercy and grace in providing her with a child. We pray, O oh God, that as you have compassion on your servants, that you would look upon us this day and feed us with the word of Christ, the gospel of salvation, that we would find in him rest from sin, rest from this world, life and delight in you and your kingdom. We pray for your blessing on your word among us this day, that we would prosper in Christ, in whose name we pray. No amount of reasoning, no amount of 
emotional appeals, no wonderful stories, no high rhetoric or uh, great theology can persuade that body to rise up and walk. It must be the work of God bringing life back into that individual and then enabling them to hear, see, and understand, and respond, to get up and walk and live and follow after Christ. So we are all together passive in this work. God acts prior to anything that we do and produces within us a renewed nature. By that, as the section concludes, we are enabled to answer this call. Paul, uh, in Rome, I believe it's Romans 8, emphasizes how man is hostile in mind and unable to do anything good. He's unable to respond to God. There's a lack of ability there by God's effectual call. That which was not present is now made present. There's now an ability where there was once no ability at all. So, we are able to embrace the grace offered and conveyed in the gospel. So salvation is all of grace. Did you respond to Christ and receive the message of the gospel? It wasn't because you're especially smart by comparison with others, or that you, you could see things that others couldn't see. It was because God, by His grace, set you apart for Himself and produced that work such that now that your eyes have been opened, now you can see, now you understand, now you run the Christ for the salvation. Next in number 221. I heard the voice of Jesus say, 221, and we'll stand to say.
I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it incurred guilt. Disaster came upon them, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, What wrong did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, and went after worthlessness, and became worthless? They did not say, Where is the Lord who brought us up from the land of Egypt? who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that none passes through, where no man dwells. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? Those who handled the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, I still contend with you, declares the Lord. And with your children's children, I will contend. For cross to the coasts of Cyprus and sea, or send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a slave? Is he a home-born servant? Why then has he become a prey? The lions have roared against him. They have roared loudly. They have made his land a waste. His cities are in ruins without inhabitant. Moreover, the men of Memphis and Tephanes have shaved the crown of your head. Have you not brought this upon yourself by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now what do you gain by going to Egypt to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? Your evil will chastise you and your apostasy will reprove, reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord God of hosts, we pray that this day your word will be spoken with clarity and with power, that Christ will be magnified in this nation, in this church, in our personal lives as well. Pray, O oh Lord, that you would sanctify us, that we might be your people, faithful to you, walking in love with you. We pray in Jesus' name. One of the benefits of capitalism and the capitalist system is that buyers and sellers come together in a market and negotiate a price. The buyer comes in and takes a look at a product that's for sale and he evaluates or determines for himself what is the value of that product. He figures out for himself how much he's willing to spend on that product. At the same time, the seller has a product in which he wants to 
advance his own interests and he feels very highly about that product, so he sets a price for it, what he expects in order to release that product. Eventually, the two come together, make an arrangement, a purchase is, is made, and hopefully both parties will benefit. The buyer gains that which he uh, needs to satisfy his own personal uh, interests and concerns, and the, the seller gains the money, the, the profit from his sale, and is now enabled to take care of his family and also to build something else, sell something else. At the center of this is a deal that is made between the buyer and the seller. Is it a good deal or a bad deal? Do both sides profit from this? Or is it really a great loss for one party in the deal? Deal making is something that Jeremiah was very familiar with, and you'll become uh, acquainted with that as we go along in our study in Jeremiah. Towards the latter part of this prophecy, he will make the purchase of a piece of property for himself, which some thought was rather a, a strange purchase because the Babylonians were, were on the horizon and they were going to be taking uh, over the nation before too long. So why purchase property there in Jerusalem? It seemed like uh, you could wait until afterwards and get a better price perhaps after it's been devastated by the Babylonians. But Jeremiah had faith in God's promise and this purchase of a piece of property was designed to demonstrate his faith that God would restore the fortunes of his people once more. And so he purchased the property, signed the deed, and held that on for, it, for himself as an indication of, of faith in God's provision for his people. On the surface it might have looked like a bad deal, but for Jeremiah it was a good deal. In the language of this text that we have before us this morning, there is the language of deal-making all throughout the course of the text. There is the talk about worthlessness and people purchasing something, making an exchange, and finding something that does them no good. There is no profit to the exchange that they made. They had something of great value, their relationship with God, and they exchanged that for something that could do them no good something that was at a great loss to themselves. They exchanged the glory of the true God for the emptiness of these idols in view of their uh, political relationships with Assyria and Egypt. And so the heart of this message here, as we consider it, will be Jeremiah's argument with the people of God with regard to what they had done. And he will make the case that they have made a very bad deal. As we look at what Jeremiah has to say, I want you to reflect on your personal relationship with Christ, with his kingdom, with his word, and ask yourself, have I made a good deal? When I, as a sinner, cast myself upon Christ as my Savior, was that a good deal? I hope you will say, oh yes, oh yes. And if you've not made that exchange for yourself, then I hope that by the end of the sermon you'll see this is an exchange that I need to make. This is something I must do today at all costs. Because, because there's so much to gain. More broadly, I hope we will consider it if you will, on a national scale, has our nation made a good exchange over the last century or two? We'll consider that a little bit later. In this second chapter, we, we see perhaps one of the first sermons that Jeremiah made following his call to the gospel ministry, which we considered last week. Matthew Henry suggested it, it is his first one. Uh, when you look at the, the beginning of the, the chapter there, the, there's not a specific time given, nor are, 
is there much to describe the circumstances in which Jeremiah gave the message. So we are left to look at the message itself and try to piece together something of when the sermon was given and perhaps who the audience was and what was happening in the, the community at that time. I think we would certainly have loved to have sat down and, and discovered where did Jeremiah give this message? Was it by the palace? Was it by the temple? More than likely it was at the temple. Uh, who was gathered before him? More than likely other priests, scribes, uh, the, the worshipers there in the temple, perhaps a few of the political people as well, the rulers as well. What was their reaction when Jeremiah stood up to say, thus says the Lord? That's a very powerful statement, even in those days, because it signified that the person making that claim was saying, I am a prophet of God. I am bearing for you a word from God himself directly this day. God says this to you. So Jeremiah was not saying, let's go back to Moses and the law and let's consider a passage of Scripture there and see what implications we can draw from that. He's saying, right now, immediately in your presence, God is speaking to you. Thus says the Lord. And any kind of opening of a message like that is surely going to gather the attention of those within the temple to at least have some sense of what a prophet is. And so it's a very bold way to begin, gathering the attention of those who were there. But note as well, Jeremiah puts himself in the position of a prophet, which is someone who is something of a mediator, a go-between. He's not elevating himself as the source of a message, saying, here's what I am saying to you, and you must listen to what I have to say. He does not put himself in that position, but rather he is a mediator. He is one who administers the word of God and presents God's word to the people of that day. The Apostle Paul used similar language to describe the work of the gospel ministry. He says we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading with you through us, be reconciled to God. And so there is this kind of a go-between, if you will, someone who stands between you and God who speaks to us today. said to the thousands who were gathered before him on the in the Sermon of the Mount, you've heard that was said to the ancients of old. And he would say an old saying. And then what did Jesus say? But thus says Moses, this is what the prophets say? No. But I say to you. As powerful as Jeremiah was when he stood before that temple and said, Thus says the Lord. Jesus far surpassed that when he says, But I say to you. He is claiming divine authority for what he says. He is the source of divine authority. And therefore, should we not listen to him? I'm reminded of what the writer to the Hebrews says. I believe it's in the second chapter where he says, uh, How shall we not listen to him who speaks to us from heaven above? He spoke to us at all from the prophets and the apostles as well. He speaks from heaven now. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I emphasize this to remind you that as we gather before the Lord from Sunday to Sunday and hear the Word of God open to us, we should listen to the Word of God and receive it on that basis. God speaking to me from His Word 
as long as the preacher is faithfully explaining what the scriptures say, and I am just a minister of that word, I am not the source, as long as the pastor is faithful in explaining what God's word has to say, then it is God saying to you, it is Christ from heaven saying to you, thus says the Lord. So it is an awesome thing to hear God speak whenever that word comes to us. Jeremiah begins his first message uh, speaking of the early days of God's relationship with his people. Early days of love, of affection, of great commitment, devotion. He speaks of the, the earliest time when God revealed himself at Mount Sinai. And you remember when God came there on the mountain with the glory and majesty of the glory cloud come down, the sound of the trumpet and the, the, the lightning and the flashes, the flashes of lightning and the thunder and so forth, and then God speaks. The people draw back and say, Moses, you speak for us, but don't let God speak to us directly. So there you have God in compassion thereafter speaking through his mediators to address his people. And they heard what God had to say, and they covenanted themselves after the Lord, and they followed after him in the wilderness. And there was a great day of love at that time. I'm reminded of something that my brother had told me some time ago. We were dri driving about uh, together, and I think we were driving close to where one of the first apartments was that he had stayed with, with his wife, his new wife. And they looked back on that first apartment with great fondness. And perhaps you think of those times as well when you first became married and you had rather perhaps poor circumstances in which to live. You had perhaps a, a, a rough apartment on the wrong side of town. You had an old car you had to drive. Uh, the meals were fairly simple from night to night. But you had each other and you were in love. And it was wonderful. It was a golden time. God says that was the way it was at the very start in my relationship with you. It was a beautiful time together. And I cared for you. I led you through the wilderness. And here is the wonderful thing. It's like a, a young wife who follows her husband around, who's trying to find his way through life working with one job and then moving on to the next one and not making a whole lot of money, perhaps moving into a strange community, setting up shop there to provide for a job. And the wife follows him along and supports him along the way. And God says, that's how you responded to me. It was a wonderful thing to see your devotion and love. What has happened since that time? What did you find in me that was so so wrong that you forsook me. And here you can, you can almost hear the heartbreak that a, a spouse might have when one party in the marriage leaves the marriage and goes off after someone else. What did you find in me that was so wrong that you had to leave? How could you do that? And so God pleads with his people, reasons with them. What was there that was wrong? I cared for you. I led you through the wilderness and took care of you even there. I protected you. And if anyone touched you, I struck them off. relationship with Christ. You remember those first moments when you came to faith in Christ. And all was made new and fresh and wonderful. Your eyes were opened and suddenly you saw the richness of God's Word. You read it through and through. You memorized texts. You shared it with friends. You were enthusiastic about what you were learning. And you told others. But after a while that becomes a little bit old 
After a while, you become a little bit weary of some things, and perhaps you wander away. Have you lost your first love? Have you strayed from the Lord who loved you so? Should you not think back and reflect on those first moments of your walk with Christ? And then compare. Where am I at now with where I once was? And can I not go back and recapture that first devotion and love? The introduction there moves on to verse 4. Verses 4 through 8, where Jeremiah, the Lord through Jeremiah, complains of Israel's infidelity to the covenant relationship. And it's rather interesting the way in which God explains what has taken place in the relationship with Israel. Uh, Israel being considered almost idealistically because the northern tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of the north, had already been devastated by the Assyrians. Uh, that's something in the background here about Close to 100 years prior to this, the Assyrians came through the, the, uh, tri the ten tribes to the north and devastated them, depopulated the, the nation, brought other people into the nation, so you had this mixed community to the north. Uh, but God speaks to Israel, those who yet remain in the north, those who might be scattered abroad, but yet they remain identified as his people, still the 12 tribes of Israel. He speaks to his, his people here and raises some questions to them. Why is it that your fathers abandoned me? Why did they not ask, where is the Lord? And then he goes through a rehearsal of the various things that God had done for them in the past. And I find it very interesting that as God reviews their covenant history, how he had delivered them from Egypt, brought them through the wilderness, established them in his own land, God reminds them of his covenant acts, his redemptive acts on their behalf, in such a way that it's almost like what we do from Sunday to Sunday. When we repeat the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and we go through a kind of covenant history of God's saving acts on our behalf. This history of redemption is something that we need to remember and to call to mind. What is it that God delivered me from? What has God done for me along the way? One of the great causes of apostasy in the, in the hearts of those who are outwardly God's people or within a country as well is that we've forgotten what God has done for us. We get our minds captivated with, the, with current events, with things that are happening now, new discoveries, new arrangements, and so forth, and we completely forget what God has done for us in the past. You might wonder why we emphasize the importance of creeds and confessions, and why we need to uh, learn the catechisms and, and, and get these doctrines in our mind. Why do we memorize the scripture and come to church each Sunday and hear God's word proclaimed and perhaps review things that you've already come across before. Well, it's because the tendency of the human heart is to forget these things, forget God's work on our behalf, and to go off wandering after other things. Things that all of a sudden seem to be very fascinating and interesting. That's what happened in Jeremiah's day. They began to wander astray and forgot God's law, God's actions on their behalf. Remember, the law of God had been so forgotten that it took a discovery by the priest in the temple to find the law again. Where has it been in all this time? They're coming to the temple to worship. Doesn't anybody look to the law to figure out what they're supposed to be doing? If they're going to be teaching the people, where are they teaching from? It's amazing what happens when people forget the clear standards of God's Word. And I'm convinced that much of that has happened in the course of our American history. We go back into the eight, late 1800s, into the 1900s, when our country began to drift away from 
a respect for the Word of God, for scriptures as having divine authority. That faith was abandoned and scripture and, and religion was explained on materialistic terms. And we wandered away from God's great work in the many ways in which he acted on behalf of the American, early Americans who settled this country and established it. There has been a kind of a national amnesia, a forgetting of what God has done in the past. And that is not without its consequences, as Jeremiah will show to the people of his day. There are consequences to our actions. And so in the ninth verse, verses 9 through 13, the Lord brings his charge against his people. The, the English Standard Version uh, speaks of contending with his people. It's really more of a charge. There's a kind of legal atmosphere here. Uh, some theologians describe this as a covenant lawsuit where the prophet acts as kind of a lawyer, a prosecuting attorney who comes and presents the Lord's case against his uh, erring people. They had a covenant obligation, a covenant arrangement with the Lord, and they've broken that covenant. And so now the covenant lawyer is coming to examine them and to place charges against them. I'm reminded of Donald Trump's recent comments about NBC uh, breaking off its deals with him and other companies breaking off its deals with him, and he said, well, I'm going to sue him. That's what I do. That's how I make my money. <laughs> the Lord's prophet is, in, in some sense, one who brings a covenant lawsuit against his people. It's a very formal thing developing here. Very serious charges that the Lord is making. And the nub of it is this, that you have exchanged your glory for that which is worthless. He uses a dramatic image here that should sink deeply into your heart. They've forsaken me, the, the, the fountain of living waters, and have hewn cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jerusalem was situated in a rather arid country, nation, where water was at a premium. And so a spring was highly valued where cool, refreshing water could come up from the earth and refresh people. And not everyone had a spring welling up within their property that could refresh them. They might have to go and travel to a spring or they might build a cistern where they could capture the rainwater and try to hold it for a period of time so that they could do their wash or, or have water to drink or what have you. The Lord says, what you have done has been to exchange this fresh spring of cool, living waters for a cistern that provides no continuing flow and always is leaking. And so you'll always be frustrated when you go to the cistern for water. I'm reminded I have buckets at home that have holes at the bottom of them and I go to move a, a bucket of water and there's a trail of a puddle of water behind me as I move the bucket around. It's no good. And God reasons with his people and says, how can you do this? He calls upon the heavens and the earth to examine what's taking place here. This is astounding. And he says, look at what the nations of the earth have done. Have any of them exchanged their gods? Have the people of uh, uh, the Islamic countries abandoned Allah and Muhammad and his prophet and given him up for the Hindu gods? Have they abandoned the Quran to accept the Bhagavad Gita? Have the Hindus ex abandoned their faith in, in, in their gods, the Vishnu and so forth? And have they sought the Buddhists and developed their own philosophy, this kind of a secular philosophy for themselves? Has anyone ever done such a thing? Have the Jews ab ab abandoned their Judaism? A little bit of question there. I'd say they've abandoned their true faith, adopted a wrong conception of God. But the point is made. This doesn't happen in areas where there is idolatry. How 
can it be that you who had the true God, the only God, the one who truly prospers you and blesses you, how can you forsake that God and run after something that can do you no good? It's worthless. The gods of the Assyrians, the gods of the Egyptians, they can do you no good. So, as Jeremiah argues later on, why do you go to the rivers of Egypt or the rivers of Assyria? Why do you look to these broken cisterns, in other words, for refreshment and health and life? You cannot benefit from them. So the political alliances that they formed and, and the arrangements with their gods that they welcomed into their communities were foolish. How can you make such an exchange? It's a very bad deal. Anytime when we depart from the true God, from His Word, and, exempt, and pursue other things, it's a bad deal. And much of that has happened in our country today as we have abandoned faith in God's Word, and instead, rather than listening to God from outside speak to us and call it to repentance and faith, we've forsaken that and pursued a pagan spirituality which uh, history and civilization has largely abandoned for centuries. We're going back to these kinds of things, these earthly spirits and nature worship and this kind of thing. It's foolish and empty. How can you make such a decision? Jesus himself stood before the temple in his own day and said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Do you thirst today for that which truly satisfies? Jesus is the one who provides living water, who satisfies your every need, who gives you true peace that the world cannot provide. You know, in, in, in this modern yoga movement or, or Hinduism, really the New Age stuff, you say um, 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 and you think the rest of the world is a, 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 a fantasy and you pursue peace in this way. That doesn't make sense. There's no real peace there. But Christ provides true peace with God and peace with one another. Christ provides living waters which he offers to you freely. We should make a good deal. Later on in Matthew's Gospel, the 13th chapter, as he begins to conclude uh, his parables, he tells the parable of uh, a, a man who finds uh, treasure in a field. And he sells all that he has to buy that field. Another man finds a pearl of great price and gives up everything to own that pearl of great price. And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like this. It is of such value that you should forsake everything that this world has to offer and give yourself entirely over to that one business transaction. Come to Christ. Make that deal. Conclusion. I remember as a young man, my Reformed Baptist brethren, talking about having dealings with God? Is your soul having dealings with God? That is, are you making an exchange with God, your sin for His grace, your wickedness for His righteousness, your death for the life that He offers? Have you made dealings with God? There is a deal that God makes with all His people to remove their sins and to give them everlasting Life. Who could forsake such a deal as that? To turn your back on such a deal would truly be foolish and bring upon your great harm. Let's trust in the Lord and commit ourselves to Him and rest in His provision. Let's pray. Father, we pray that your word would speak to our hearts this day and that we would think back to that day when that great transaction was made in our own hearts, where we gave up our sin and all the rags of our own righteousness and received the perfect righteousness of Christ as a garment to clothe us 
that we be transformed by glory, made new in Him. We pray that you would help us to refresh our great love for you, uh, that love which you once inspired within us. Help us to return to that and walk uh, with faithfulness before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's give ourselves the Lord at this time and bring before Him our mind's eyes.
and worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Forgive us for our sins and grant us grace to love and serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. As we prepare for God's word of forgiveness, let's turn to hymn number 341 using the red hymnal. The red hymnal 341. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. 